Hi, my name is Julie Ann Link, and welcome to the Music Link. This week on the Let's Link project, I'd like to welcome primary school teacher and the associate principal bassoonist with the Dunedin Symphony, Jackie Hopkins. Thank you so much for being here, Jackie. No worries, my pleasure. Jackie and I met about 10 years ago playing together with the Opus Orchestra in Hamilton, New Zealand. I remember we played Ludwig van Beethoven's Seventh Symphony together and we made such a good team. So Jackie, could you please share with us an overview of who you are and what you do as a professional musician? Okay, well primarily I'm a primary school teacher and as a kid that was always my goal to be a teacher so I guess I reached that goal um, but I was lucky enough to be introduced to the bassoon by a teacher when I was uh, 15 and then because there's not many bassoon players in New Zealand I sort of fell into all these different jobs um, and I've well I've worked pretty hard at it and then when we moved down to the South Island I rang Dunedin Symphony um, who I'd worked for 30 years ago. And I said, I'm around, do you need a bassoon player? And she said, yeah, we do. Okay, cool. Um, and luckily I didn't have to do an audition because I had a couple of friends who vouched for me because I've done a lot of music playing in Auckland. So I didn't have to do an audition. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Dunedin's only very much part-time. So I just take leave from work when we're doing concerts. And I'm really looking forward to doing Beethoven 9 in June this year. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And we're so lucky because we don't have to worry about COVID too much. Just a little bit. Yes. Yeah. So we're very, very aware that we can do this and a lot of people can't. Yeah. Jackie, it's good that you brought that up. Dunedin Symphony is the only orchestra in New Zealand that did a concert in one of our lockdown levels. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah because we did a concert uh, and we were allowed to have 400 people because we had to, you had a maximum of 100, uh -huh. but they cut the town hall into four sections and they divided it all off with curtains and each section had their own entry, their own toilets, their own ticket people. Uh, the chairs were all set a meter apart. Uh, it was the most bizarre concert, mm. but very, very well received. Um, a different sound in the town hall because you're used to having, I don't know, 1,500, 1,600 people in there. So it was a little more, bit more lively than it normally is. Um, and we did a wee bit of a cut down program from what we were supposed to be doing just because of lack of players. We couldn't fly anybody down from Auckland, certainly couldn't have anybody international. Um, so, but we did a good, I can't even remember what we did to tell you the truth, uh, but it was great. Interesting experience. Mm -hmm. well, Pete actually but if we were lucky to be able to do some music um, we also did a chamber music concert um, which was for it was a closed concert it wasn't a public one but it was for subscribers who had chosen to donate their annual subscription to the orchestra so they didn't have to pay to come they just got an invitation and it was like a thank you for paying us paying us some money and not wanting it back so my husband, who's a clarinet player, and I, and another clarinet player from Dunedin Symphony, played Mozart Divertimento, and it was very lovely. <laughs> really cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. just a little crowd. And luckily for that one, we were out of level, uh, I think we were in level one restriction. So our audience could come in and they could actually sit close together, and it was sort of almost normal. And that was also uh, recorded, televised, which was quite cool yeah so that was last year's very special music making mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah Jackie could you share with us more about what it was like growing up in New Zealand um hard to compare because I haven't grown up anywhere else but um I was actually born in England and yeah. we came out here when I was three years old um, on a ship. I can't believe my parents came with a three-year-old and a five-year-old on a ship. But my dad was into computers and not many people in 1965 were into computers. It sort of was early days. Um, and so his company paid for, paid for us to migrate. Um, and then, I don't know, we just went through primary school and then intermediate school when I was 11, 12. 
And then we were talking about this earlier. Then I went to college, which is not university. It's college. It's high school. So, yeah, that's our secondary school, um, which is where I started learning wind instrument stuff. Yeah. That's a good place to grow up because it's mm -hmm. friendly and safe and, yeah, you can pretty do pretty much do whatever you want. It's a good, mm -hmm. good place. Could you share with, the, with us more about how you got introduced to music and the bassoon in New Zealand? Uh, okay. Um, my sister, who's older than me, started at Music Centre. And I was thinking about this last night and I remember the teacher, my sister would have been seven and I would have been five. And she went to Mrs. Morgan at Saturday morning music classes and learned the recorder. God forbid. But anyway, that's what we, that's what she did. And I never actually went to recorder classes, but I went, I just sort of sat in with hers and picked up what she was doing and copied that, which annoyed her, but that's okay. And then I decided because my best friend at school, when I was eight, my best friend at school was an amazing piano accordion player. I said, mom, I want to play the piano accordion. So I went to piano accordion lessons at, at Saturday morning music center and I got all the way through to grade three. Wow, <laughs> I don't play it now. Uh, and then Dad uh, loved Akabilk because Dad was from Bristol and Akabilk lived in Bristol. And so Dad wanted to play the clarinet, but because of the war, he'd never had any opportunity to do music. Um, so he found a clarinet, I've no idea where he got it from, and said, oh, you learn the clarinet at school and then you can teach me. So I started learning the clarinet when I was 13 through the itinerant music scheme um, and did that for two or three years, three years. And then my clarinet teacher, who was a bassoon player, um, brought in a bassoon one day and said, do you want to play the bassoon? And I have to admit, I said, what's that? <laughs> I'd never heard of a bassoon, never seen one. Um, well, I probably had seen one at the back of the orchestra, but never really twigged to what it was. Um, so I'm not a person that says no. So I said, yeah, okay, well, why not? And I took this thing home and, and yeah, my family thought I was a wee bit crazy, but that's okay. <laughs> so I just sort of fell in love with it. It's, it's an awesome instrument. Um, it's not an easy instrument. I think it's easy to make a sound on. It's not easy to make a good sound. Um, the fingering is a nightmare, but you get, you get used to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, and I just love it. I still play clarinet occasionally. I've actually, I'm actually teaching a little girl clarinet at the moment. Um, yeah, so that's that's where we're at. Yeah, so I don't play the piano accordion anymore, ever. Don't ask me to. <laughs> <laughs> that's a no. <laughs> uh, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I'll do many things, but that is definitely you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the piano accordion was actually really cool. Um, because I've never had any trouble understanding or being able to hear harmony. Mm -hmm. Because of the way the bass structure on the piano accordion is organized, it's organized in the cycle of fifths. Um, and you've got the major chord, the minor chord, and the diminished chord all there at, at your fingertips. And so, you know, at secondary school and at university, when we we're learning about the harmony, I couldn't, you know, everybody else was struggling with it. It's like, why can you not hear it? Mm -hmm. but I think because I'd been hearing it since I was eight. Yes. Just, you know, it's, it's what I hear when I listen to music. I hear the harmony. Wow. I, don't, I, don't hear, I don't hear the melody so much. I, I, well, the harmony is what grabs my attention. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, and I'm sure that's, that's from the piano accordion, you know, having that basis really good grounding in, in the cycle of fifths and how all the chords work. It's fantastic. I can still play a scale on the bass. It's cool. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, interesting, interesting how little things change, you know, mm -hmm. influence what you're doing now. Yeah. Jackie, could you share with us more about your university study in New Zealand and what the music programs were like there? Um, it's quite different to what it is now, that's for sure. It's changed mm -hmm. a lot. Um, when I applied to do university um, I applied to do a bachelor, I was doing a Bachelor of Arts, not a Bachelor of Music, because I'd only been playing the bassoon for two years and certainly wasn't of any standard to start university. Um, 
but having to get into the music department, it was very small. And so you had to do an interview. And at my interview, I had to play my bassoon, which was mortifying because I was still very much a beginner, really. Mm. And I also had to play the piano. Wow. They said to me, you play the piano? I said, no. And they said, oh, here's some music. Just so read this for us. It's like, I just said I don't play the piano. But I suppose, again, because of my piano accordion experience, I mean, it was probably about a grade one, grade two sight reading. You know, it wasn't difficult, but it's like, I don't play the piano. But anyway, um, so I did a Bachelor of Arts. I did it in music and education. I did a double major, um, which was all academic. Um, but having said that, uh, Ruth Brinkman was finishing her degree in my first year. So she did all the bassoon stuff and we played together in the university orchestra. But then when she finished her degree, there was nobody else who played the bassoon. So I did, <laughs> I did all the orchestra work, all the chamber music. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the Carl Heinz company. It's contemporary. They, they do all sorts of contemporary stuff. So I was exposed to all sorts of weird and wonderful compositions that we wow. did at lunchtime concerts. Great. Um, and that's, sort of where I started doing professional work because Professor Godfrey, who was the head of department, um, came up to me one day and he said, oh, can you play for the, a well, it wasn't the APO then, what was it called? An Auckland Symphony or something. Can you play for that? I said, oh, I don't, you know, I haven't done any professional work. He said, oh, well, here's a chance. So I went and played and it was absolutely the most terrifying thing I've ever done. Um, but I was sitting right sort of under his nose. It was um, very small work I think it was Baroque stuff we were doing and I was right under his nose and every time I looked up he'd just smile at me and I thought well I must be doing okay Aww. anyway so it sort of that led to other things and yeah and so it sort of grew but yeah but as far as um, my university degree it's, it's very much an academic degree mm -hmm. um, you know analyzing music and doing music history and all that sort of stuff but I think I count myself very lucky that I had the chamber music experiences in the orchestra that I did. Mm -hmm. uh, ch uh, our chamber music used to be tutored by Stan Jackson, who was a principal oboe and APO. And he was a lovely, lovely man and very, very helpful. Um, yeah, an orchestra, <laughs> an orchestra one day I was playing principal. God only knows what we were playing. I can't remember, it's too long ago. And um, the conductor who was the one of the violin teachers, he was conducting the orchestra at the time. And he, he absolutely bailed me up for not doing enough practice on my part. And at the time I was doing six stage three papers and I was sort of snowed under with work and assignments. And it's like the bassoon practice just wasn't happening because I didn't have time. And I, I stood up and I said, well, actually, I don't have to be here. So I'll see you later. You find somebody else who can do it for you. Anyway, I went back to the next rehearsal and he apologized. He said, I thought you were a performance student. So I've taken that ever since then as a compliment. Yes. That he thought I was, I was a performance student, which, yeah, would have loved to have been, but I just, everything was just started a wee bit late. But that's okay. That's quite cool. Yeah. Jackie, could you share with us about your music teachers and how they influence your teaching philosophies and views on music and playing the bassoon? Okay. Um, my music teacher at school. Hmm. Um, he was a bassoon player, but he was a full-time itinerant teacher. Um, do I need to explain that? Yeah, that, that would be good. Yeah, define itinerant teacher. Yeah. The itinerant teachers um, go into secondary schools and some intermediate schools they go, but mostly it's a secondary school thing because the Saturday morning music classes only go up to the end of intermediate school, so 12-year-olds. Uh, Mm. Like once you get 13 and you go to high school or college then you start on the itinerant scheme which is mostly group lessons small group lessons and the itinerant they're called itinerant because they might teach at three schools or five schools or ten mm -hmm. schools or whatever whatever work is available and some of them are full-time uh, my husband's done a lot i've done a bit of it mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty thankless job <laughs> because you're not highly regarded by the staff in the school. Mm. Um, always. I mean, the music teacher's are always very glad to have you there, but, but none of the other staff, they, they don't really understand why you should be there at all. Um, 
sometimes you're lucky enough to get enough time to teach one on one, um, but mostly it's group. Um, so the guy that taught me was teaching clarinet, oboe, flute, bassoon. Uh, don't, uh, no, he didn't do brass. So he was a woodwind and he was full time um, in the area where I was at school. Um, so he started me on clarinet. And apparently I, have, well, I was his star pupil, which I didn't find out till after he died. <laughs> his wife told me and I felt really guilty because I never actually liked him. <laughs> Which is really awkward, and I hope she doesn't watch this. Um, <laughs> yeah, he was, it was interesting at the time, which I didn't know, but uh, looking back, it was really interesting because the philosophy and teaching at that time with Woodwind was to not mention breathing. Okay. Because the philosophy was that breathing is a natural process, and if you start thinking about it and overthinking it, you're going to screw up the natural process. So I knew nothing about breathing other than you had to take a breath and blow. That was that was it. Mm -hmm. So over the years since then, I've actually felt quite a lot of anger about that because it's taken me a long time to fix that. Yes. And fix the habits that came with not knowing what to do properly. The mm -hmm. first I knew about it was, and this I guess as a teacher, I went to Cambridge Music School, which was a huge institution for many years, summer school. Uh, you'd go for, was it a week, Ten, five days or something. And you all come together and you, we stayed in tents and got up to all sorts of shenanigans and played some amazing music. The one I went to, we did the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. And John Hopkins from Australia was conducting, and it was pretty awesome. But Ron Webb, who was the principal oboe in the NZSO at that time, he was the main woodwind tutor. Wow. And he auditioned us all at the at the music school. It's like, what are you doing? We're not supposed to be auditioning. Anyway, he wanted to hear all of us play individually, which was really scary. Um, and then he got all the woodwind into this classroom and sat us all down. And he said, we need to talk about breathing because, of course, all of us have been through this don't teach them how to breathe system. And so nobody knew how to breathe properly. And so that was the first time I heard anything about a diaphragm or muscles or mm -hmm. anything like that. And it's like, why, why am I being told this now? Why didn't I know this before? Um, and so... Yeah, <laughs> so that was that was Chris. I guess he was a nice guy um, and very supportive and he didn't have to have chosen me to do bassoon. So that was probably the result of being his star student because I used to practice and nobody else did. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we used to have scales competitions and I always won. But, yeah. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> I was a bit nerdy, I suppose. But anyway, yeah. Um, and then when I left school, I went into university and um, I had a year of lessons from Mark McEwen. I don't know if you've heard of Mark. Mark used to play for APO or whatever it was in those days. Um, and he was such a lovely, lovely person. Um, and he gave me a lot of confidence. I think it was probably him that really helped me get through the university orchestra and the chain music and stuff because... He just was so positive and gave me so much confidence. And he introduced me to the Mulday scale studies, which I'm still trying to finish something like 30 years later, but we're getting there. <laughs> yes. um, unfortunately, he got very ill that year. Um, it was very sad. He got extremely ill by the end of the year and that was the end of the lessons. And he gave me a lot of his music. Um, he gave me his reed making tools. He basically gave up. Um, I think he's gone back playing a little bit. He does more sort of jazz jazz bassoon and, and guitar and stuff now. I haven't seen him for a long time, but he was such a lovely, lovely, lovely person to learn from. And I went to, <laughs> I went to, uh, had, uh, how do you pronounce it? Dido and Anais, the uh, Purcell Opera. Mm. I went with him and we sat in the front row and he was already quite unwell at that stage. And I was only 18, 19. And here I am sitting at this concert with this teacher you know, and I didn't go out much with boys or anything like that. It's like really awkward. Anyway, and he, he bawled his eyes out the whole way through this opera. Oh. And I just didn't know where to look. <laughs> uh -huh. So every time I hear that music, I think, oh, God, that's awkward. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm very grateful to him um, for that. And then um, had a couple of lessons from David Angus. Uh -huh. um, 
and we we did a little bit on the vapor bus in concerto mm -hmm. but it never really worked out with my work and and the, the nzso timings and it just wasn't a happening thing and then nothing for a very long time until uh 10 oh no 15 years ago maybe i can't remember it's a long time now and i kept getting headaches every time i played i'd get this migraine headache for over a week and i thought wow. this is Perhaps I'm getting too old, you know, it's, this is, perhaps it's not me, perhaps it's, perhaps it's, you know, I'm not supposed to be playing the bassoon anymore, I'm not, it's just, I'm over it. So I thought about it, I thought, no, perhaps I should have some lessons and find out what's going on, and it took me two or three years to pick someone that I thought that would work for me, mm -hmm. um, because I sat next to Philip Sumner a lot, and I thought, I don't want to destroy that, we had quite a good relationship, and I didn't want to destroy that, by, yeah. by being a pupil teacher. And then I sat next to Craig Bradfield and we did this um, um, chamber music stuff. We're doing wind octets and we were doing this concert on Hamilton and I had to come in really quietly on an E flat. I remember the note and every time it would crap out and I oh, what the hell, why can't I get this note? You know, it was pianissimo so, and every time we go and it, or it wouldn't speak or whatever. <laughs> and Craig just sat next to me and very quietly just, just went, Duh, like that and then I'd go Duh, and it would work it's like geez this guy knows what he's talking about mm -hmm. <laughs> so um I asked we were rehearsing something else later on and I said um I wondered if I could have some lessons from you and he looked at me absolutely aghast and went what me teach you I said yeah but on one condition that you teach me as a beginner because I never had proper beginning lessons I didn't consider what Chris had done as proper beginner lessons. And I said to him, please do not assume that I know anything. Mm -hmm. I don't. Everything, everything I know is from what I've observed. Uh -huh. I, I get confused with terminology, but I'm too embarrassed. I'm being, as a paid musician, I don't know even know what these words mean. Mm. You know, people, people would rattle on about having a scented sound. I said, what the hell does that mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but you're too, you can't. You know, in an orchestra or, or in a theatre orchestra or whatever, you can't go up to people and say, well, you know, what are you talking about? Because mm -hmm. you look like a right foot. So anyway, then start, that started <laughs> probably the most important and um, valuable time yeah. of my life so far. Uh, I learned from him for nine years because mm -hmm. I'm a really slow learner. Um, <laughs> he'll, he'll verify that. Um, <laughs> We not only learn bassoon, he's just um, the most amazing guy um, and just in terms of life and philosophy and yeah, huge influence, huge, huge influence. And I'm forever grateful to him for what he did for me. Mm. I always thought, you know, when I asked him for lessons, I thought, you know, I'll have a couple of lessons and we'll sort a few things out, get rid of the headache and we'll be done. Yeah, no. Even now, even now, I still send him recordings of me playing because he's living in Sydney at the moment. Um, he's still giving me feedback and suggesting yeah. things. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, really awesome. Beautiful, Jackie. Yeah. Did you always know that you wanted to go into music for a career? Um, no. It sort of happened by accident. Mm -hmm. I've always loved, I've always loved music. When mum and, and uh, Beethoven symphonies, when mum and dad, you know, you know, when mum and dad go out, the kids sort of go a bit nutty. Well, mine going nutty was putting Beethoven symphonies, you know, on records, of course, um, vinyl. Uh, Beethoven symphony, I think it's Carry On, just as loud as possible on the stereo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I never would have been allowed to do when mum and dad were home. <laughs> I mean, they always had. They always said we didn't listen to the concert program. We always had the national program on, you know. So you get the sort of pluty voice, talk, 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 and then I put a little bit of music on. And um, I've got memories of music that always have my brothers crying all the way through it. You know, there'd be certain pieces of music, and I think, oh, yeah, there was always crying when they were playing this on the radio, because it was always around tea time. You know, when little kids are getting scratchy and crying, and yeah, so that's my memory of some piece of music but Beethoven symphonies that's always been my thing you know mm -hmm. 
I know them really, really well because I oh, I used to dance around the lounge and go absolutely nuts. There's just something special about them. <laughs> Bit crazy, but yeah. Beautiful. Sounds really fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just, it, I don't know, it speaks to you somehow, doesn't it? It, it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but going in as a career, um, I think when I started university, I was really sad that um, I hadn't been playing long enough to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to do a master's when I finished my undergraduate degree. Um, but I had to have a foreign language, which I didn't have mm. and still don't have. I had to be able to speak Italian or German or French. It's like, yeah, no, nah, I haven't got that. And I couldn't do masters in education because despite checking with them the year before, I was one paper short. So I was <laughs> somewhat annoyed, actually. Um, yeah. So I just went off to Teachers College, which was, uh, yeah, that was a horrible year. And then went into teaching. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but I've been I've been lucky. I've been lucky with work. Yeah. Jackie, are there any tips or advice that you could share with us around what you learned about the music industry since working professionally? Um, oh, a couple of things. One, be prepared. Like like, just know the music. It's absolutely no good turning up if you haven't prepared. Listen to the music, know how it's likely to go. Panic a little bit about the speed it might go. <laughs> um, if there's some technical stuff, um, luckily most of the time it doesn't go at quite the same speed as the recordings, but um, yeah, you just need to be prepared for that. Um, and also just be prepared to get on with people because you just, you, you, I find that music, and this is something that my colleagues at school don't really get that you're sitting it's such an intimate thing to play in an orchestra um yeah. and you sit next to the same people and you don't have a choice in who you sit next to you you turn up and you you're sitting next to your principal and if you get on with them great and if you don't well you've just got to suck it up and get on and play music together and that's a really it's a very intimate relationship that you have mm -hmm. um that People who don't play in orchestras don't quite get that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have to go in very much with an open mind. You have to be prepared to listen and be flexible, um, but have some conviction in what you're doing with your part, but be prepared <laughs> to, to um, change it, to fit in. Um, and as a second bassoon, just being so aware of, of intonation and the fact that you, the second part is equally or more important than the first part, not because you have all the nice solos, but because you are the foundation of, of the wind. Mm. It's taken me a long time to learn that. Um, but I think, you know, you're actually really critical. And it, it came home to me one day, We well, one of the octet concerts that we did in Hamilton, mm -hmm. uh, I missed a repeat. And the second bassoon part goes boom on the first, first beat of the bar. And everybody was off the beat and the whole thing just about collapsed because I didn't play that one note. Mm -hmm. So, well, okay, I'm actually quite important. <laughs> yeah. um, but I just think, you know, second bassoon, um, being aware where you sit on the chord, whether you're the root of the chord or whether you know you're sitting on a third and an invasion or it's just so important and playing when I do play first which I do sometimes I actually miss that I miss that you know you're sitting up somewhere in the middle of the chord and it's like I don't I don't like I've I'm not feeling right here I want to play the bottom <laughs> uh -huh. um yeah so yeah just be prepared to get on with people and and be prepared to listen and um be cooperative I guess Mm -hmm. in, in, a much, in a much higher at a much higher level than most other jobs mm -hmm. um, teaching in a classroom yeah I'm cooperative at meetings but in my own classroom I'm the boss so uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah I'm mm -hmm. not the boss of the orchestra <laughs> sometimes I'd like to be but yeah no. <laughs> Jackie could you share with us with us more about your teaching career and also teaching as a primary school teacher? Yeah, it's hard work. <laughs> um, 
yeah, you know, I always wanted to be a teacher, so I went, I got a, I uh, won a studentship, which doesn't exist anymore, um, where I got paid to go through university to do a degree, and then I had one year at Teachers College, which was dire. I'm so glad they've they've done a shake up of the degree of the Teachers College thing now because it was just such a waste of a year. But I got married that year, and I had my twenty first that year, so I had other things on my mind. Beautiful. Um, and I started out teaching little five-year-olds, which are really cute. Um, just teaching in the state system, because in New Zealand you've got state system and you've got, there's three levels, you've got the state system, which most people go to. You've got integrated schools, which are mostly church schools, but not all of them. They're schools of a special character that the government partly funds. And then you've got private schools, which the government funds very, very, very small amount, and the parents pay a lot of money for their kids to go to. Um, why I'm telling you that is because after a few years, um, I did a few years teaching, then I had my own children, and then back in the state system, but then I got a job um, for 13 years teaching at a private school, a private art school, and it was the only one in New, it was the only one in New Zealand, and it no longer exists, so there is no art school in New Zealand, which is very sad. Um, but I didn't teach music there, um, which is really strange, but I taught mostly maths and English. Um, right through from five-year-olds right through to 15-year-olds, which keeps you busy. Um, but it was a great place to work because totally immersed in an arts environment, um, which for me was just amazing. Every Friday we'd have a lunchtime concert and we'd have these amazing kids playing music, doing ballet, um, some really cool drama stuff. And I also got to meet um, my amazing, the amazing art teacher. Um, and she and I got on really well and we had the most amazing conversations and it was just neat to be in that arts environment. Then we moved down to the South Island uh, in 2015 and that was going to be the end of my teaching career and I was going to retire. But money doesn't last as long as you think it's going to. <laughs> mm. So yeah, I'm back in the state system and I'm teaching year eights who are 12 year olds. Um, and it's their last year at primary school. And it's um, most places in New Zealand or in cities, you have the intermediate system, intermediate schools, which is two year school, year seven and year eight, so 11, 12 year olds. But because I'm in a more rural area, we have what's called a full primary. Mm -hmm. And it goes year one to year eight. So by the time that I get the kids in year eight, they're over primary school. They've had enough. And out my classroom window is the high school that they're going to go to next year. And you quite often catch them sitting there you know, gazing over there, wishing they were already there. <laughs> so, but they're quite a, I've got a lovely bunch of year eights this year. Um, and I do, I do music with them. I've been doing some sort of Carlo sort of stuff with um, ostinato stuff and marimba and that sort of stuff. Um, it's very much in this area an uphill battle because there is no music. Um, my husband taught I turn on here for one year and just about, went crazy because the kids come through to secondary school having had no music at all nothing they don't even know what it's supposed to sound like um it's a very very sporty area it's a farming area um if you don't play rugby then who are you you don't exist mm. so to try and get some music going is is a challenge but i'm now running a lunchtime concert every thursday we have a lunchtime concert oh. and i've got some keen little kids who come along and do mm -hmm. some dance, sing a song, and yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> Thank you for doing that, Jackie. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So that's that's my teaching career, really. Mm. I, thought, I thought about sort of you can go on a career path where you, um, I was a deputy principal at the art school, and that was quite busy, but quite good. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I'm just happy just being a teacher because it's mm -hmm. a hell of a lot less stress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you know, people want to go on a career path and become the principal and do this and do that. But yeah, no, nah, not for me. I'd rather work with the kids. It's mm -hmm. a strange system, strange system where you get promoted to a point where you actually don't work with children anymore. Right. Why would you do that? <laughs> you become an administrator. You spend all these years becoming good at teaching kids and then you become an administrator. Right. Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. So I, I, lead the, I lead the arts program such as it is, but I'm gradually building it up. But it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's definitely pushing stuff uphill, I tell you. That's, that's the hard part of my job. 
Yeah. But I teach, because I'm primary school, I teach everything. So we do um, PE and maths and English and science and everything. Hmm. Yeah. It's busy. Mm -hmm. yep. They all know, like... they all know, <laughs> they all know what a bassoon is, though. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> Have you introduced your reads to them yet? Yep. Yep. No, they've Good. seen the read. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I did a little sequence. I haven't done it this year yet, but I um, got some friends on, played the violin and the viola and cello. Uh, there's no one local that plays double bass, so I haven't done that. They're interested, you know, there's, there's interest there. It's just getting it to happen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Jackie, could you share with us a favorite concert experience that you've performed in or attended? Lots and lots and lots. <laughs> I, lo I love going to concerts. Mm. It's There's not too many around where we live, so we have to go down to Dunedin for anything decent. Um, but it, as far as performing, I think the one that really sticks in my mind, the, my favourite one, was a long, 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 long time ago, and we did um, Petrushka with um, APO, and I was playing second bassoon. It has a big second bassoon part. It has a big first bassoon part too. Um, and it was one of those choices that you make and I was driving along the motorway into the concert and the rehearsals had gone reasonably well and Philip Sumner was playing first and he was quite happy with what I was doing and I thought I can either get really really nervous about this and screw it up or I can just commit this, I mean it sounds a bit religious but I can commit this performance to God who's provided me with the opportunity to do this stuff. Mm. Um, and so that was what I did, and I've done it a couple of times since then, not not, not so often, but um, that was my thought as I was driving along the motorway, this wow. is for you, this is, this is, you give me the opportunity, this is for you, and I tell you what, I had an absolute ball, it was so much fun, yes. um, but concerts can be stressful, um, concerts can go horribly wrong, Mm -hmm. and this one had the potential to go horribly wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah but that was that's memorable in that i think it was the first time really that i'd made actually made a conscious decision not to be nervous and to enjoy the experience and to play music not for myself but for somebody else I did the same when my dad passed away. Um, he passed away. So I actually missed a rehearsal on the day that he passed away. And then the following week, we had the dress rehearsal, which was on the day of his funeral, which was really hard. Um, but anyway, I, I went to the dress rehearsal um, and I played to dad. And actually, it was really beautiful. It was a lovely thing to do. And I'm tearing up now just talking about it. But um, yeah. yeah, I I think if you can play to somebody else in such a meaningful way yeah. is that um, any performance anxiety becomes uh, um, so negligible and so unimportant that it's it's not an issue. I can't do that all the time um, mm -hmm. because it's a pretty intense thing, you know. I mean, I played to my dad when he passed away and we'd had the funeral, which for me was a pretty traumatic experience. Um, beautiful though because the orchestra that particular orchestra Manukau Symphony Orchestra every time someone loses a family member or gets married or has a baby they always have a gift oh. um, and the manager who was my first teacher's wife just coincidentally small world New Zealand um, she came up to me and she said would you prefer a rose or a camellia because and I said oh I'd love a camellia I love camellias so I said, please don't, don't present it to me because I won't cope. You know, I'll fall apart. She said, no, no, no. We learned that a few years ago, they had a harp player who lost her mum and they presented it to her at the rehearsal and she got so upset she had to go home and couldn't rehearse. <laughs> so she said, no, no, no. What we do is we just put it next to your chair. I said, that sounds like a really good idea. <laughs> so when I got to this dress rehearsal, here was this beautiful little camellia sitting next to my chair which is very sweet so my daughter now leads the second violins in that orchestra now and she got a lovely gift um when we left there we got a beautiful book presented to us when we left Auckland and then my daughter's also had a present for getting married 
and she's due with a baby soon, so I guess she'll get a baby present. <laughs> Beautiful. But it's just a really nice thing that the orchestra does to look after their players. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really... the, the performance anxiety thing is a big thing, and um, yeah, I've struggled with it a lot. Mm. Um, but I don't now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't bother me. Um, and I think, I think the whole concept, which if someone said this to me, and I think it was told to me that you're presenting music to other people, so therefore it's not an issue, that's something that you have to really experience and take on board in your heart before you can actually use it. Mm -hmm. um, the whole concept that you are trying to get the composer's music and communicate your ideas and things across to your audience, it's a very sophisticated concept. Mm -hmm. and it's Thing that 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 takes a long time. What took me a very long time to to um, put into practice, I suppose, or, or to mm -hmm. you know get it in your psyche. Yeah, so it doesn't bother me now. I get my bassoon and yeah, whatever. I probably would still get horribly nervous if I had a lesson. Mm -hmm. This the most nerve wracking thing I ever do. But yeah, <laughs> um, I think doing. I don't know. You know about mindfulness. Mm -hmm. It helps. Mm -hmm. it helps. Yeah. Yeah. And standing with both feet on the ground. I, I played at a masterclass. Um, an Australian lady whose name I've forgotten at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I played and I thought she was going to talk about the music. She said, Do you always stand playing on one foot? Do I? I don't know. Do I? I probably do. And she said, If you put both feet on the ground, you'd feel a lot safer and, and, mm -hmm. and nervous. So, okay. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, because apparently I used to, I, I probably still do it. I hop around, you know, one foot, one foot, one foot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but she talked about being grounded, mm -hmm. and that that's also helped a bit. Yeah, it's a it's a personal battle, and I had I had arguments. I had discussions with my teacher <laughs> about about beta blockers. Mm -hmm. um, my husband went through a stage of using beta blockers to compo co to cope with the nerves, mm -hmm. and I said to him, "I said you must there must be a way through this without resorting to drugs. There uh -huh. must be a way to do it. You must be able to find something within yourself mm -hmm. to overcome it." I thought I was going to vomit. Mm -hmm. um, there were certain reasons for that, but. Um, yeah, I actually, it was like vertigo. It was so bad. It was like having vertigo and you just can't move. Yes. You, you're supposed to be walking onto the stage and you actually can't move your body. <laughs> right. Um, that's, that's the worst it gets, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I've never done the beta blocker thing. And I, I don't think, I think it's something that you actually need to work through rather than trying to avoid by taking drugs. I don't know. That's just my mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my personal take on it. And I think, I think, I think I'm there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Think I've done a concerto with an orchestra a couple of times and, and um, wow. been absolutely fine. Gone out there and actually had a ball. Had really uh -huh. yeah. yeah, and that's what it's about. But yeah, don't, don't cry because it could hit again. <laughs> <laughs> it could happen again. I'm sure it comes in waves. I'm sure mm. there, are times, there, are, mm -hmm. there will be times when, you, when you're really anxious and times when you think you might be and then you're not and you, mm -hmm. I think sometimes you worry about being anxious <laughs> you talk yourself into being anxious mm. um, yeah I don't know I really love how you're talking about how the second bassoon is this anchor for the yeah. wood section and then it's also about finding that anchoring within the self yeah to yeah. share and yeah yeah, I think you have to go outside of yourself, which is which is what mindfulness and meditation sort of teaches you a little bit too. You just, although you're going so far in, you're also going out. It sounds weird, but mm -hmm. yeah, it becomes uh, your 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 music becomes part of you. Mm. And then through it becoming part of you, you're you're then communicating it with other people. But until you get to that point. It doesn't really happen. <laughs> yeah. I've noticed it, just linking it back to my teaching, because I used to um, work a lot with, with student teachers and first-year teachers where they have to have a mentor. Mm. For the first year. 
Um, and there comes a point, and I actually did some research into this a while ago, a long time ago. Um, there comes a point where they're no longer worrying about themselves. They're now worrying about what the students are understanding. Um, and I've seen it happen with drama students. I've heard it, I've seen it with public speaking. Um, and there's a turning point and it can happen overnight. And you just, um, you know, you observe the student teacher and they're all worried about what their lesson plan says and what they're saying and how their questioning sounds and whether they're responding to the students appropriate. And it's all very um, looking at themselves and judging how they're speaking and judging how they're working with students and what they're doing. And all of a sudden it goes click and then they're, they're not worried about themselves at all, but they're focused totally on the students. Wow. And, and, and the same with public speaking. Instead of worrying about what you sound like, um, worrying about what you're saying, whether your sentences are making sense, whether people can hear you, all that stuff, you become focused on the message. Mm -hmm. And what you're actually doing becomes more effective because you stop worrying about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's 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 what happens in music too. I've seen it happen. Um, <laughs> my son's one of his girlfriends was playing the piano, and she was always terribly wooden. And you'd hear her play, oh, you know, just, just let it happen, just just play. And then one day she did this amazing performance. It's like, what happened? It just changed. A different person. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, I, I imagined that Jason had died. It's like, what? <laughs> Mm -hmm. But she, you know, the emotion of the music, actually, she was able to focus on that and communicating that and stop worrying about what her fingers are doing and stop worried about, um, yeah, and how you, how you make that happen, which was sort of what I was trying to research, how do you switch that on on a student? Mm -hmm. It's a really difficult question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, how do you, how do you reach that point where it goes click? And they're 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 out there with the audience or out there with the you know with the students that they're teaching or you just mm -hmm. get to this point. That's how to how to bring that point to fruition. Right. How to make it happen? Yeah, quite and complicated. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. a good point, Jackie. Yeah, with yeah. time, time and life and yeah. experiences. Yeah, it's just something that you have to build. Um, mm -hmm. And you can, as an observer, like as a, as a mentor for observing students teaching, I've actually been very privileged to see that happen. And that's mm -hmm. what you really start thinking, how do we make that happen? Because you, mm -hmm. you see it happen. You know, they'll be teaching Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and it's wooden and it's, it's self-conscious and it's awful. And then Friday, boom, it's, it's you know, suddenly something happens. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. <laughs> confidence it's it's more than that though yeah really interesting jackie could you tell us about your read making style and techniques uh, i cheat a little bit because i used um gouge shaped and profiled cane mm -hmm. so i use riga 1a um shape and i use danzy cane i went with gonzalez for a little while but i i uh, it was taking me a lot longer to get reads that I liked and mm -hmm. they didn't last as long and I just found, I don't know, just the, maybe the batch that I had, I found it too fibrous or the fibres were too fat and so when I was scrapping it was taking too much off. And mm. So I've gone back to Danzi and I'm very happy with Danzi. Um, at some stage I want to experiment with some different shapes but Due to a mailing error, I've ended up with an awful lot of Danzy Kane <laughs> Riga 1A. Wow. So because I don't make that many reads, um, that's, that's going to take a wee while for me to get through. Um, I had a lesson from, um, I learned first of all from David Angus. He taught us at Otakite Music School down in the South Island. We came down on a motorbike and went there and he taught wow. me how to make a read. That was a long time ago. Um, and then I had a lesson because when I was making reads, it would keep splitting. After about a fortnight, the read would go okay, and then it mm -hmm. would split up by the wire, mm. and it would go right through. I said, like, oh, "What the hell?" So I went and saw Melbourne Mackey, who used to play principal bassoon in Covent Garden, thirty-five years. Lovely, lovely man. Great friends with Gordon Skinner, um, and he showed me a very quick way to construct reads, and it's worked a treat. I've never had a dud 
since then. Um, and he said, oh, you don't want to worry about beveling. That's a waste of time. And you don't want to you do this and you do that. And so you put the first wire on really tight. It's soaked, of course. Um, and you wind it around with the wet string and, and shove the mandrel in. And then you put the wires on. It's very simple, very straightforward and very quick. Um, and it works, except for one small thing that I've had trouble with is the blades slipping. Mm -hmm. side to side. And I was talking to Philip about it, who makes wonderful reeds, and mm. he said, "Oh, because your bevel's not right. It's not. It's not sitting flat." Oh, okay. So maybe I'll look into this beveling thing. And then um, <laughs> Christopher Wyatt, I don't know, because I chat with him through Bassoonist United, mm -hmm. um, and he's got a, a bassoon making book that you can buy. And so I've got a copy of that. I'm very grateful to him because he didn't mail it because the mailing was going to cost twice as much as the actual book cost. Yeah. So he sent me a PDF. I've paid for it, but he's, it was very kind of him to do that. Um, and he talks about beveling there. Uh, and the other thing that he said about beveling is it stops the, the blades closing up. Mm -hmm. the tip so I thought, well, that's actually something else my reeds do, which is annoying. Is they do tend to close up, I and mean, I'm forever open, open, open. So I'll oh, get back to this beveling then. <laughs> so just in the process of um, creating a beveling tool, so that it'll be consistent. Because the trouble I have with beveling, which is one of the reasons I stopped doing it, apart from Melbourne Mackey saying it was a waste of time, is it's hard to get it so it's absolutely accurate. Mm -hmm. you can one side a different angle and doesn't quite work. So yeah, that's a work in progress at the moment, but. Um, yeah, I just I put the reeds together reasonably quickly. I like to do the Turks, the Turkish knot because I like the look yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm quite good at it. I might as well say that I'm quite good at it. And I don't like the I don't like the shrink wrap just because it doesn't look very nice. Mm -hmm. mm. I like my reeds. I like my reeds to look nice. Yeah, uh, and I like them. I like them to be um, resonant. And I think I think they're quite soft. Um, mm. But I. I gave one to a colleague of mine in a lo little local, local orchestra mm -hmm. and he played a couple of notes and he went, oh, that's so hard to blow. What? It was really easy to blow. So it's just, just to set up what you do, I guess. Yeah. Um, they're not particularly good. Uh, the jury's out on whether it's my vocal or my reeds or probably both. They're mm -hmm. not so great up, up really high. Mm -hmm. Being a second bassoon player, yeah, not that worried that I can't get an E, you know, not many E's in second bassoon, bassoon repertoire. Yeah. <laughs> um, solo work, yeah, um, and we've had some discussions about that with my, my teacher. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I've got a very nice vocal now, which I bought recently, I've got a heckle vocal now. Exciting. Yeah, oh, it makes an amazing sound. Oh yeah. my God, it's beautiful. Um, but still, the high notes... Uh, slightly better but okay. yeah still not, still not great mm -hmm. yeah I'm, I'm getting better at it but yeah but mm -hmm. I think partly that's that's my read in the style of my read they're beautiful second bassoon reads mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're really rich lovely easy to speak I can get a quite low B no no issues pianissimo mm -hmm. easy you know there's no worries and I can control an F sharp and all those other notes that tend to go mm -hmm. but yeah, my reads don't do that so that's cool but yeah, probably if I was playing principal, they'd need to be a little bit more um, gutsy. Mm -hmm. you know? Although I can play pretty loud. <laughs> yeah. Jackie, a vocal comes to mind for the extreme high notes that I have that I have and use. It's called a Yamaha super vocal. Oh, I, oh the super vocal, love, yeah. I love this vocal. Yeah, yeah, I've tried a super vocal. Yeah, because Craig had one think? and I tried it. Um, on my bassoon with the my reeds, it was it was quite muted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the high notes were good, but it was really muted, and I thought mm -hmm. yeah, really nice for chamber music. Uh huh. Um, but I wouldn't do it, I wouldn't use it all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The one one big disadvantage of being in New Zealand is mm -hmm. that you can't try these things out. Um, I went to a Double Reed Society conference in Melbourne once. Mm -hmm. Very expensive. I ended up buying a new bassoon. Wow. Um, 
Yeah, but you can. You know, it was like I was like a kid in the candy store because you go over there and there was literally a mountain of vocals. Wow! And it's like what? <laughs> and, and, and bassoons, bassoons to try out. You know, you can't walk into a shop anywhere in New Zealand and try out a bassoon. Right. You're just you're not for sale. You know, you mm -hmm. want a bassoon, you've got to either buy a second-hand one that somebody's got, which is how I got mine, or you order it from overseas and hope like hell it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, and, and so I went to this Melbourne thing, um, and uh, Murray, uh, Peter Musson was there with all these Fox bassoons, you know, mm -hmm. the Reynard Foxes and the 240s and the 220s, and he had a 660 there, and I was supposed to go to these classes and be listening to seminars and all that sort of stuff on the mm -hmm. Saturday. Nah, I just stood there and played his bassoons yeah. all day. <laughs> How fun. Yeah, oh, it was amazing. And then I found this other 660 bassoon because I was playing on a Model 4 Fox plastic one. Mm -hmm. I really liked it. It was good. Mm -hmm. It was one of the best Model 4s because I've tried a few with you know students and stuff. And my one was a good one. It was mm -hmm. a really nice blowing one. Some of them tend to be a bit stuffy. Um, but then I played on the 660 bassoon and I couldn't go back to my plastic one. I just mm -hmm. fell in love with it. And so I talked to Gordon Skinner and, and this bassoon, I've got a 601 and that came up for sale not long after. So I say it was a very expensive trip to Melbourne because <laughs> yes. he ended up buying, buying a bassoon. It's like, whoa, but never look back, never look back. So, Jackie, yeah. speaking of bassoons, I'm admiring your beautiful bassoon behind you. Could you tell us uh, a little bit about that instrument? This one here, yes. um, like I said, you can't go into a shop <laughs> and buy a bassoon and a lady at work um, another teacher came in and she said, oh, there's a bassoon for sale in a second hand shop in Alexandra, which is the town closest to us, which is a little town, 5,000 people. And I said, what, are you sure it's a bassoon? Who's, who, who, who sells a bassoon in Alexandra? Yeah, so you can't buy a bassoon in Alexandra. There's just no way. So she said, yeah, I'm sure it's a bassoon. It said bassoon on the label. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's the same as what you play. Okay. So I went in the next day into this little second hand shop and there's a bassoon. I was like, oh my God. And I'd taken my reeds in. I didn't take a vocal, but I took my reeds in. I thought I'll just try it, see if it works. Put it all together. The guy in the shop had never seen one put together before. He didn't even know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And there was a bagpipe chanter in the case as well. He thought that was part of it. I was like, yeah, no, I don't want the bagpipe chanter. Um, anyway, it worked. So they wanted two hundred and twenty-five dollars for it. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. Thanks very much. I've got no idea what I'm going to do with it. But it, does, <laughs> it, it does work. Um, and this other bassoon player who lives an hour and a half drive from me mm -hmm. had a range of old, battered old vocals, and mm -hmm. he said, "Oh, try, try some of them out because it works beautifully with my heckle vocal." But I'm sure as hell not going to give that to it. Um, so I've got a very battered old Fox C vocal uh -huh. that actually works with it. Because the vocal that it comes with, oh, the intonation's all over the place and it's not good. Um, but that's not, uh, that's just the vocal. Because when I put this other vocal on, it's actually quite nice. It's a bit stuffy. Mm -hmm. uh, the key work is old. Um, as far as I can work out, I think it was made in around 1920s. Mm -hmm. Um, it was made in Paris. It's 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 a rosewood or palisander bassoon, um, and it's jury's out on whether it's genuine or not, um, because apparently they had what were called stamp bassoons, mm -hmm. and it, uh, mass produced these bassoons and then copy the the stamp and and push the stamp into the wood. Mm. Could be for real. I don't know. Hard to tell. Wow. Um, so there's a couple of things I want to do to it. One is to change the um, whisper key because it's miles away from the C sharp key. And when I try to play C sharp, my thumb falls down the gap. So there's a guy in Queenstown that's doing instrument repairing. So I'm hoping he can rebuild the key so that they're closer together. Mm. Uh, old German German silver key work. But I don't I don't think it's been played very much because you know the tone holes mm -hmm. that are on. There's no wear. Right. It looks in so, beautiful condition from what I've seen before. Yeah. It's really old, but it's mm -hmm. um, it hasn't been played much. Mm. So I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. Mm -hmm. Maybe so. I don't know. 
I don't know. Exciting. Yeah. So it's just sitting here at the moment. Every now and then I give it a bit of a bit of a blow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm trying to trace the, the background of it. I know it was bought in um, 2003 because there's a receipt. Mm -hmm. The girl at the second hand shop obviously didn't see the receipt because it was sold for two and a half thousand. Yeah, that's um, a whoops. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he sold it to me for 225. So, okay. Mm. I mean, if nothing else, I'll turn into a lamp stand, but it does actually work and it's actually quite cool. There's uh -huh. no leak. There might be a slight leak, maybe down on low B or low B flat. They're a little bit tough to get, but yeah, interesting stuff. Thanks for sharing, Jackie. What are important skills learned through music that apply to everyday life that you could share with us? Probably the most important is perseverance. You know, if you if you don't get it today, you might get it tomorrow, or you might get it next month, or you might get it in three years' time. It's um, yeah, you've got to stick with it, eh? And and believe in yourself. I think I think that's probably the most important, but also the hardest. Mm -hmm. So many musicians um are so full of self doubt. In fact, so many artists of any sort just struggle with self-doubt all the time and it's never good enough you know the Pablo what's his name Pablo Cassells the cellist mm. in his 90s someone asked him why he was still practicing he said because I'm not good enough yet you know <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> come, on, guys. come on man um, yeah I think perseverance and just believing that you can you 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 can do it or you will be able to do it at some stage mm -hmm. yeah yeah, and it applies to everything. You know, you're trying to make something or you're trying to, I don't know, get better at something or just get better at being organized. Just mm -hmm. stick at it. Mm -hmm. so have, have, have goals. You might never reach them, but at least have them. Yes. And, and, and stick with it and just and get there. I, I keep, I, um, every now and then I'll say to myself, right, that's it. I've come as far as I can possibly go. I can't do any better than that. And then a couple of days will go past and you think, actually, yeah, maybe I can. Yes. And you, you set yourself some new goals. And so, yeah, just believe that there's more, there's always more and, and persevere and find out what it, what there is. It's a huge journey. It's a huge mm -hmm. journey. It's something that Craig taught me. It's it's not about the end result. It's it's the journey. It's the journey that's the exciting part. <laughs> yeah. And what you learn about yourself on the way. I think you, you learn a lot about yourself because how how do you express yourself if you don't know enough about yourself? Right. That's that's profound, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jackie, is there any advice that you can share for musicians just starting out their music careers? Persevere. Mm -hmm. Persevere. Be brave. Believe in yourself. Be very open to suggestion. Be observant. Be observant. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. That's how I learned a lot of what I know is just be observant. Watch, listen, watch, listen, watch, listen. Yeah. Do I like this? Do I not like this? If I don't like it, what don't I like about it? Yeah. Be observant. Watch and listen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that would be my biggest advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anyone that you'd be interested to suggest to be interviewed next for this project? Um, my friend Natasha Port, because what she's done, I, I taught her. She was my, one of my students um, who ended up going to university. And then she's gone down the path of instrument repairing and is very good at it. And I just think she's a really interesting person um, and still a very good bassoon player. Very mm -hmm. good bassoon. Yeah, yeah. I'd love you to interview Ola, Ola Christian Dale too. Yeah. Sometime. Oh. yeah, that would be amazing. He's he's my sort of idol that sits on a pedestal somewhere up in heaven. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, not on earth. He's sort of somewhere up there. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. We'll have to tell him that <laughs> from yeah. Jackie. <laughs> Maybe you're wearing it. <laughs> yeah. No, because Craig used to um, sit next to him in um, Kuala Lumpur, I think, a long time ago. Yeah, lovely guy. 
Beautiful. Well, thank you for those recommendations, Jackie. And thank you so much for this opportunity to interview you and to get a glimpse into your life and career as a professional musician. Thank you. It's been fun. <laughs> for everyone tuning in, keep an eye out for two events held every week on the Music Link. Every Thursday, Central Daylight Time, a new YouTube video launches, which is Friday afternoon time in New Zealand. And every Sunday, Central Daylight Time is a live Zoom group discussion session, which is Monday afternoon New Zealand time, with great new guests every week that you can register for on the Music Link website. Check out Jackie's hosting session coming up this Sunday, which is Monday, New Zealand time, where she's sharing more about being a member of the New Zealand Double Reed Society, what it's like growing up playing music and the bassoon in New Zealand, what it's like to be a music teacher in New Zealand, and all about what the music scheme is in New Zealand. Find out more about Jackie's work on the Dunedin Symphonies website at dso.org.nz. Please like, comment, and share any questions or feedback in the section below, and subscribe to this channel for notifications, which really helps keep the music link moving forward. Check out the Instagram and Facebook pages too for more information. The Music Link is a New Zealand-based online resource for people around the world to share, learn, and connect through music. Thank you for watching, and I'll see y'all in the next video. We're talking about music and visual art. Could you share with us some of your paintings that you do? Would you want to sh kind of sh if, um, show your camera and would love to see some of your work? Uh, yeah. Wow. That's my latest one at the moment. It's um, a friend of mine's mother and my friend's little grandchild mm -hmm. and my favorite one is up on the wall here uh, wow he's a guy who lives about 15 minutes drive from us and he's uh -huh. an absolute character so yeah and then our little bit of landscape i don't know where are we Whoop. Doo -doo. there we go wow this one. gorgeous yeah, that one's not mine. Yeah, so oh, I'm all tangled up with cables here. <laughs> Jackie, how long do each of those take you? Oh, a long time. <laughs> uh -huh. Like months. Uh, to work over it. Uh, no, uh, probably uh, the one I'm doing at the moment. We're probably up to about twenty hours. Don't know. Wow. Um, it's pretty intense and I um, I was doing it this morning and I got to about oh no, 12 o'clock oh, I have to have a break yes because it's really intense concentrating people say oh you do painting it must be so relaxing it's like no it's exhausting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the one behind me is not mine that's my son's wow that one's beautiful he, too he mm. did that at school and he mm. was just gonna throw it out I said no 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 no, no. don't you throw that out yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um yeah so that's i've done a lot of other stuff many a lot of drawing and i've done yeah. um um uh, an orchestral series and it started as a drawing challenge where you had one word each day and it was during lockdown and the word for the day was miss and i thought i miss playing my bassoon in the orchestra so the drawing that i did i put my phone on my vocal <laughs> and took a photo of the bassoon so I could get the details accurate and then put the orchestra in behind it so it's like um, I'm sitting in the orchestra and I can see my bassoon which is always in the way um, and then the orchestra behind and then I thought oh actually it'd be quite fun to do the other instruments so I've done um, I think I've done all the orchestra now and my sister's written a little kid's book that we're using using the pictures to illustrate wow <laughs> but it's, 
there's there's a lot more work to go on that yet but yeah so i've done yeah i've done the oboe and the french horn and the flute uh the trumpet was embarrassing because i i did it and i got the trumpet inside out and i put it up on facebook and then a friend of mine that plays the trumpet he said yeah that's really good but it's inside out and it's like oh no, oh, no. i had to delete it and um take it off facebook take it down take it down um and you know i've got it around the right way now <laughs> Where can we find that, Jackie? Is that on your personal page? Or my, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, all my, yeah, yeah. Wow. If you go to images, um, I think, uh, yeah, I think you can. I think it's, uh, it might not be, it might be private. <laughs> yeah, but I can share it with you if you want. Yeah, I would love that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I loved what you were saying about music and the tie between visual art and just as a space to express ourselves. Um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. a really tricky thing to quantify because um, mm -hmm. um, I did that. I started off when I was working at, at the art school at Corelli. Um, I put myself through, well, the teacher there, we went, I did the Cambridge photography course. And you have to sort of explore other people's artwork and um, explore how that relates to what you're doing. Um, which you do in music as well, I guess, because you're listening to recordings and thinking about how pe how things happen. Uh -huh. uh, and just through discussions with her, I thought, actually, you know, there's so many parallels between art. I mean, even right down to mathematical basis. You know, you've got the you've got the color wheel. Mm -hmm. Well, guess how many bits are in it? There's twelve bits in it, and we've got twelve semitones in our scale. And there's so many um, uh, mathematical relationships between art and music and and you've got your harmony and your balance and your um well articulation i suppose in art is is, is your fineness or your def definition of line um you've got your different textures there's just so much that's the same yes um anyway so i thought oh, i'll get into this art so I, I a long time ago i used to do drawing never did art at school um and the more I drew, I don't, I, how do you define the moment when it happens? I don't know. But I went back to a lesson with Craig and I can't remember what we were working on. He just looked at me and he said, that's chalk and cheese. What have you done? I said, I haven't done anything <laughs> particularly. But it just suddenly became, because the art teacher said the same thing as he did. And she used to say, you have to have something to say. In your art, you have to have something to say. What are you trying to say? And I, oh, that question used to bug me because Craig would say to me, you have to have something to say. It's like, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean you have to have something to say? I don't I don't get it. I'm playing the notes. I'm playing the dynamics. I'm playing the tempo that it says. What do you mean I have to have something to say? And it didn't make any sense to me. And then I was still seeing what this art teacher was doing with her students and um, seeing how different things could be given the same motivation, you know, with different kids. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go in there and at lunchtime and we just do some drawing and she got all excited one day because I drew a skull with a pink pencil. And I and she said, oh, doesn't that look amazing with pink pencil? And I said, yeah, but it was the only pencil that happened to be lying on the table. It wasn't a conscious choice, it just happened to be there and I just felt like drawing. So I guess all those sort of things and the discussions we had and Craig really pushing, you know, you got to have something to say, you got to have something, you know, and, and be committed to your music. And it's like, yeah, what does it mean? Uh -huh. And I still don't think I could define it. But yeah, I was going to ask you, how do you feel today? And, and... Today, I, I feel like, like when I'm practicing, if it's going well, that doesn't always go well. And sometimes you just put the bassoon down because it's just like, yeah, no, this is not a happening thing today. <laughs> um, but sometimes you just, you just get so engrossed in the music mm -hmm. and it just sort of comes out but you have to be in a place where you can allow that to happen mm -hmm. um, something else that helped me with that do you know have you heard of Kenny Werner he's mm -hmm. a he's a jazz, jazz pianist and he wrote a book and did a CD series um, called Effortless Mastery um, yeah. And he talks, he, he does this thing where you get into a meditative state and then you pick up your instrument and you, you 
deliberately try and stay in that meditative state and so that you are not in control. Well, it's the scariest thing I've ever done. I picked up my bassoon and just blew it. And the noise that came out is like I've been possessed. Uh-huh. And I put the bassoon down and left the room. I thought, I can't cope with this. Wow. And I think in some ways, I, I, I haven't experienced that again because I'm too scared to try it. But um, <laughs> mm. it was a really, really creepy experience. But it really showed me that, yeah, there is much more to me than yeah. just playing in an academic way. Um, and that probably, just all these experiences all come together. And I think now, I mean, I'm playing the Malcolm Arnold um, fantasy, well, trying to play it at the moment. And just every now and then it just it just clicks and you just forget what your fingers are doing. You forget the notes on the page. I mean, you're playing the right notes, but it's not about that anymore. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It's not important. And it's, you know, you get you just get swept away with it. And oh, an orchestra, you get swept away with it. An orchestra is just amazing. You just get taken out of yourself and you're just, it's like this huge tsunami of music and you just get, you know, you just, I don't know, it's, it's amazing. 